Okay. Um, so we, we continue. We're now going to be talking about um, the anatomy of of the separate joints, and we're going to start with the knee joint, which is the which is the most complex joint in the human body. It actually consists of several joints that are surrounded by a joint cavity. There is a femoropatellar joint, you can see it right here. The joint between the patellar bone. Marvin gives us a good um, view here of femoropatellar femoropatellar joint right here. It's a gliding joint. My fingers are on patel, so that's gliding joint. And two tibiofemoral joints, lateral and medial. You can see a lateral tibiofemoral joint and medial tibiofemoral joint here in this model. So the joint between the femur and the tibia is not really direct joint. If you would look at this, you can see that condyles of the femur articulate with the menisci more than they articulate with the uh, condyles of the tibia. This joint allows for flexion and extension of the knee and a little bit of the rotation in the knee when it is flexed a little bit. So when knee is flexed, there's a little rotation. Okay. It's extremely complicated. So there's so there are a lot of bursae. Okay. You can see suprapatellar bursae. You can see infrapatellar bursae, subcutaneous bursae. They all isolate ligaments and bones. Uh, from rubbing against each other. The main reinforcement for the knee joint comes from the muscles, muscle tendons. And if you think about the tendons that are involved, it's patellar retinacula, which extend the tendons of the quadriceps muscles, quadriceps tendon right here. So essentially, it's going to be rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, all those massive muscles, okay, on the anterior aspect of your femoral region will stabilize the joint. And remember, we talked about the fact that stronger muscles mean more stable joint. So if you want stable knees, you've got to do squats with weight. Question? Good. So, like, is that... Does that like apply certainly like certain people can't uh, can't stand uh, I guess like a lot of jumps like a lot of uh, not sky, like well I guess skydiving or parachuting mm -hmm. like they're, like they're because they are they haven't strengthened their muscles and their legs probably like so probably so um, you well you have to appreciate another thing that those um, the issue with the joint stability is different for different types of sports for instance I'm a runner. I don't need extremely strong legs in terms of I don't need to squat with 500 pounds because my effort, my, I bump a lot with a sort of a, a mid-sized weight, with my body weight, but that's what acts on my knee joint. If you think about the person who do the, um, what's that word when people do like ski jumps from, the, from that, like they slide down on the, they ski down and then not necessarily even flips just they fly on the skis like 300 feet and then they land when they land the momentary force that acts on the knees is about thousand pounds so these guys they experience it once during the exercise that makes sense just once but it's an enormous weight so for them having extremely strong legs not necessarily very uh, high endurance, but strong legs is, is important because that's another sort of force that acts. Does that make sense? So people who would do the ski jumping, you don't do 60 ski jumps in a minute. Uh, not 
ski, but parachute jumping, you know, high diving. People who, who do the parachute jumping, they don't, don't do 60 of them in one minute. Right. So it's one, two, three, I don't know how many in a day. So, but every time it's an enormous force that acts on the knees. So yeah, they need to do exercises with a lot of weight more than endurance exercise. Mm -hmm. and it's just like, all right, yeah, you got knee problems, or yeah, you like, you got more screws than like than the next guy, the next guy, but you know, like, I'm, I'm like, you know, significantly like way less than you, but I don't get these problems. You're jumping, like, but they're generally they force yep. and body weight are not necessary, not directly related. We can talk about it and talk about muscles, but they're not directly related. Now. Uh, technically, <laughs> joint capsule, which remember we talked about um, the, the fibrous layer, external fibrous layer, separate capsule, it is not there. A whole bunch of the walls of the joint capsule formed by the ligaments, like the patellar retinacula and patellar ligament. So all those ligaments and retinacula and extra capsular ligaments, they all actually, well, not extra capsular, but all those retinaculin ligaments and tendons, they form a joint capsule. Now, uh, the ligaments that are outside here, the fibular collateral, and it's kind of easy, you know, fibular collateral ligament, tibial collateral ligament are extra capsular, and then they prevent hyperextension. They make, you see, you can't do this to the knee. You can't hyperextend it. Does that make sense? The ligaments on the posterior aspect of the joint, like this oblique popliteal ligament and arcuate popliteal ligament. I try to draw this to demonstrate you the direction of the ligament. Oblique, what does that mean? No, 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 oblique. At an angle. Oblique means at an angle. So oblique ligament runs at an angle. Arcuate runs as an arch. Okay? Arcuate ligament. They have oblique ligament kind of shown here. Okay? prevents hyperextension. Can you see that? So essentially, if somebody involuntarily hyperextends the knee, so experiences frontal blow to the knee, then those popliteal ligaments will be torn. Might as well be the, sorry. The, to stretch for what? Oh, it's probably sprained. You sprained the ligament. You can't, so you mean you damaged the ligament? Yeah, it's, it's a sprain. It's not stretch. Yeah. I understand what you were told, but it's a, it's a different word for it. Now, uh, ligaments that are inside of the capsule they prevent the anterior and posterior displacement of the knee. What I mean by that? You see, well, it's kind of not stabilized well, but it doesn't move forward and backwards that much. It doesn't move forward and backwards because it has these two ligaments that are called cruciate ligaments. Anterior cruciate ligament, right here, is attached to the anterior aspect of the tibia and to the posterior aspect of the femur. Can you see that? I'm pointing at ACL. That's in famous ACL. Okay? Now, you can appreciate that if ACL is hypothetically torn, 
then nothing prevents the knee from moving backwards. Do you see that? If ACL is torn, the knee can move backwards. It's one of the diagnostic um, approaches. Carefully, if there is a suspicion that ACL, ACL is torn, move femur backwards a little bit. If it's going backwards more or less free, likely ACL is completely torn. Does that make sense? Yes, you have to immobilize the knee. We'll talk about the repair of the torn ligaments. Okay? Posterior cruciate ligament, it's a posterior tibia attachment. Cannot be really well seen there, but that's posterior cruciate ligament. So it's posterior tibia and more of an anterior femur. So it prevents it from moving forward. Does that make sense? Um, now, knee, in terms of the mechanics, can absorb vertical force. Remember I told you about the strength of the femoral bone? Femur can withstand like 2,000 pounds. Easy. Vertical force. It's not going to break. Same goes for TB. TB is extremely strong. But the, and, and same goes for the knee. Vertical force that it can absorb is extremely high. But the problem comes when, that when knee experiences the lateral movement. If the movement is um, sliding, gliding movement, which shouldn't be present there, that may damage the menisci, which often happens you know, during the, the, the plays, the games. Okay? Usually the force that you develop by quickly stopping and running and, you know, that knee slides is not sufficient to tear the ACL, but may damage the menisci. A lot of professional athletes or amateur athletes that play soccer, football, basketball, which involve stop and go movement, especially stop movement, lateral movements, experience problems with menisci. When does, when is ACL torn? Usually it's a lateral blow to the knee. Medial blow is just rare because it's really hard to hit here. It's much easier to hit from the, from the outside, lateral side. So during the lateral blow, right here, this is what happens. Well, This, okay, that's lateral blow. The fibular collateral ligament stays intact, it's fine, but tibial collateral ligament is torn first, then it goes cruciate ligament, and then meniscus, because cruciate ligament, sorry, uh, collateral ligament and meniscus are attached, and meniscus can tear. So, depending on how heavy the blow is, the degree of damage can be different. It can be only the TCL torn, it can be TCL and ACL, it can be all three. That makes sense. So, that blow is the most, one of the most common, you know, damages that are done to the knee. Shoulder joint is a ball and socket articulation of the humeral head with the glenoid cavity of the scapula. It's the most freely movable joint in the body, but it's one of the least stable. It's not the, the, the most unstable, but one of the least stable. One of the examples for lack of stability. Do you know how kids love when, especially little kids, when you grab them by the arms and you start to like rotate them like this and then you dislocate the shoulders? That proves how easy it is to dislocate. Okay? Um, if you've seen the movie... Uh, uh? I, I, like, um, I've, I've 
I've seen like my like my little uh, like my little cousin, my like, uh, his shoulder his shoulder literally I've seen it like go all the way out and then he's popped it back in yes. without any pain. Well, uh, actually, yeah, but it means that his shoulder is even less stable than the one of the normal person, and that means that his muscles are at higher risk of being torn or being strained um, when the person does any wide range movements. Because stability is necessary, for instance, for lifting weights, you need them stable. You need the shoulder joint stable. If you watch the movie uh, Lethal Weapon Part 3, Jesus Christ, I'm that old. <laughs> Lethal, whoop, Lethal Weapon. The third lethal weapon, yeah. Lethal weapon when he, then well Mel Gibson character gets almost drowned, and he's in a restrained, whatever it is called, straight jacket. Yeah, and he pops his shoulder and somehow frees himself. I'm not sure about freeing himself, but popping shoulder it's pretty common. There's a famous video of American rugby player who got his shoulder dislocated on the field, and he was running just. So he get his shoulder dislocated after the tackle, runs forward, pops it back, and just keeps playing. Yes? What exactly does it mean to be double jointed? Is that like a real thing? Like Jacques was saying, some people can pop their shoulders out of place or like put them all the way back, and they say that it's because they're Okay. I, I'm, it's, it's a jargon as far as I can understand. It's not a medical term, double jointed, but there are two things. First, you, sometimes the injury to the joint may lead to the, uh, say, if the ligament was partially torn, it doesn't restore completely, which adds a degree of freedom to the joint. But usually this joint, then, it becomes more freely movable. But the problem with that joint is that <coughs> it cannot help you to lift a lot of weight. Yes. It's not as stable, so you, you have reduced sort of weight-bearing capability. Another condition which you may have heard about is called Marfan syndrome. It, Marfan syndrome is sort of an extreme version of a whole group of um, connective tissue disorders, which are associated with various degree of joint flexibility. Um, some people, for instance, they have, they can kind of bend their knees backwards a little bit. Mm. It's a sign that there's not, the connective tissue is not 100% proper. It doesn't mean that they're going to die early or something horrible is going to happen to them, but that's a sign. If you've ever seen in a circus people who can like fold themselves into the suitcase, and then you do all crazy stuff like folding twice, you know, super flexible people. It's not because they trained for it. Well, partially because they trained, but also usually those people have connective tissue disorder, which allows their joints to move freely. Okay? That makes sense? Now, uh, even in the normal person's shoulder is, you know, pretty unstable. Now, what are the ligaments that reinforce the shoulder? Coracohumeral, the ligament that attaches the humerus to the coracoid process. Sorry, it's coracochromal. That's coracohumeral ligament. So coracoid process in the humerus. Okay, that's one stabilizing ligament. Also, a bunch of glenohumeral ligaments. You can see that glenohumeral ligaments here, they sort of uh, form a cup around the head of the humerus. Glenohumeral ligaments essentially attach the glenoid cavity to the humerus. Does that make sense? Let's think about this. You have glenoid cavity right, right here. Ligaments are attached to the walls of the glenoid cavity. And then they attached to the head of the humerus. It's not going to be extremely stable way of attachment. It's like a band of connective tissue that links glenoid cavity of the scapula. Glenoid cavity of the scapula 
with the head of the humerus. So that's not very stable either. And moreover, in many people, some glenohumeral ligaments are absent. So it, it's even less stable. So the main stabilizing forces are tendon of biceps brachii. You can see right here the tendon of the biceps brachii and tendons of rotator cuff muscles. Some of them are present in this picture, say tendon of subscapularis muscle. Okay. Now what you need to understand about shoulder joint. Stability versus movement. Free movable but not very stable. Ligaments that stabilize it. Coracohumeral and glenohumeral ligaments. In terms of muscle tendons that stabilize it, all I want you to know, biceps brachii and rotator cuff muscles. I will not ask you these four names yet. Not on this exam. Am I clear? Elbow joint. Well, it's pretty simple. Elbow joint is the hinge joint. The main movable part is the articulation between the trochlea of the humerus and trochlear notch. I'm trying to show it to you. Olecranon notch. Sorry, trochlear notch on the ulna. That's where the hinge is. See that? Also, of course, head of the radius articulates with capitulum. <clears throat> That's head of the radius, that's capitulum, they articulate. Now, the ligament called annular ligament here, it surrounds the head of the radius, enabling pronation and supination of the forearm. Can you see that? So that head of the radius is covered with annular ligament. Let me see if I can find it. Now, on this model, there's annular ligament is, is absent, actually. They may have more of a stabilizing tendons, okay? Now, speaking of the tendons that stabilize the joint, obviously, look at this. Can you see the elbow? That's the triceps. That's the biceps brachii. That's the brachialis muscles. So essentially, the flexors and extensors of the elbow stabilize the elbow. Another group of muscles that stabilizes it are flexors and extensors of the palm and fingers. Does that make sense? Okay. Any muscle that crosses the joint will stabilize it. A lot, so um, ulna and humerus are connected by the ligaments, okay? Interestingly enough, radial collateral ligament connects both ulna and radius to the humerus and ulnar collateral ligament connects, connects exclusively ulna to the humerus. For elbow joint, stabilizing muscles, Flexor and extensor of the elbow, flexor and extensors of the palm. Three ligaments, anatomically know them, ulnar, um, collateral, radial, collateral, and annular ligament. And of course the movement, because you may get the question, what type of movement uh, can be performed by the elbow joint? And you tell me it's... Flexion and extension only. Hip joint. Uh, very simple joint, I'd say. Articulation of the femoral head with acetabulum 
of the hip bone. So here you can see the articulation of the femoral head, kind of, sort of. It's, it's right there, it's under those ligaments. Does that make sense? Can you see that? That joint is also ball and socket, like shoulder, but it is more stable. <coughs> Why? What makes it more stable? It's kind of a, a, a consequence of being more, st well, more stable, less movement. What anatomically, look at the picture, what anatomically makes it more stable? It's ball and socket. Deeper socket, yes. Much deeper socket. Bone-wise, look at acetabulum. It's much deeper. Okay? So this is the glenoid cavity in the scapula. And this is acetabulum in the hip bone. Obviously, acetabulum will provide better, more stable articulation. On top of that, on the edge of acetabulum, there is a, um, a rim made out of fibrocartilage called acetabular labrum. Labial, labrum, labia means lips. So labrum, that acetabular labrum here, works like lips on top of this acetabular border, which makes the articulation on the hip side is even deeper. Does that make sense to you? Okay, we're good? So dislocation of the hip is rare because it's stable. It makes sense because it bears weight of the upper body. Ligaments that reinforce. There are three ligaments that connect different parts of the coxal bone to the femur. Iliofemoral that connects ilium and femur. Pubofemoral that connects pubis and femur, and ischiofemoral, which connects <coughs> ischium and femur. If you would look at the model, look at the model. When they are all together, they form like a sleeve. Can you see that sleeve right here? If you would rotate it around, it's like a sleeve that attaches the head of the femur to the acetabulum of the hip bone. Additional ligament, which you cannot see on the model, but you can see on the picture here, it's called ligamentum teres. It attaches head of the femur, <coughs> sorry, to the acetabulum. Does that make sense? So it's inside, it's like little tiny ligament, but it directly attaches head of the femur to, to the acetabulum. Stabilizing muscles, there are many. Psoas muscle, massive, strong muscle of the leg. Gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, gluteus maximus. Um, obturator muscles, uh, blanking on it. Anyway, the muscles in the hip, multiple muscles in the hip, they stabilize the hip joint. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask you about all those muscles that stabilize the hip joint yet, okay? But what you need to understand, here's what you need to understand: stabilizers here are flexors and extensors of the hip. That please know, flexors and extensors of the hip will stabilize the hip joint. 
my clear. Important mandibular joint. It's actually interesting. There are two separate synovial joints. Okay, there's an articular disc between two joints, the upper joint, superior joint, is between the articular disc and the mandibular fossa, and the inferior joint is between the condylar process of the mandible and the articular disc. So that's condylar process, that's mandibular fossa, that's for the articular. See that? It's a hinge joint when it comes to depression and elevation, and it's plane joint when it comes to gliding movement. Okay? Does that make sense? It's the most easily dislocated joint in the body. And before we go to the injuries, okay, so um, we're going to talk about the injuries to the joints. And um, think about this. There are two major elements in the joint that can be injured, cartilages and ligaments, okay? So the cartilage tear is usually due to the shear stress, compression and shear stress. What I mean by that? This, this will not damage the meniscus. But this vertical pressure and then slide can damage the meniscus. Does that make sense? That's how it gets damaged. Cartilage doesn't really repair itself successfully. Why? Yes. Vascularization is really poor. So um, the repair for the cartilage is so-called arthroscopic surgery. Especially, well, since we're talking about meniscus, this is what the surgeon sees. Okay, so meniscus, femur, tibia, instruments are inserted in the knee okay and there is a little camera that allows the surgeon to see what's going on so like a couple of little incisions and the surgeon removes the um, cartilage fragments okay does that make sense because there are little fragments they may be they may actually lead to locking the joint so you cannot really move the knee because they Think about this, like fragments of something in something gets stuck in the in the in the wheel in in the car sometimes, you know, and it makes those sounds and it's weird sounds, and then it just cannot move anymore. Okay, so that what can happen? Arthroscopic surgery takes care of those fragments and removes them. Of course, of course. Uh, meniscus is not as good as it used to be. Okay, so think about this. If you remove some of the cartilage tissue right here, it will impair the feet, so stability will be partially sacrificed, and also it will increase the rubbing of one bone against another. Does that make sense? Um, so, meniscus removed, joint is still mobile, less stable but still mobile. A friend of mine got his part, part of his meniscus removed. He used to be an avid runner, now he's an avid bicyclist because you cannot run anymore. Too much wear and tear. If the meniscus removed entirely, completely, it leads to the condition known as osteoarthritis. That's the very common complication in football players. Since they experience a lot of shear stress, 
on the meniscus. Very frequently, meniscus is damaged, meniscus is removed, you know, every so often, bit by bit. Eventually, there is no meniscus left, and there is no meniscus left, ends of the bones start to rub against each other, which leads, which leads to the condition known as osteoarthritis, which we will discuss in a short period of time. And young people can be repaired with the meniscal transplant. Since now we have a technology to do the um, induced pluripotent stem cells, to make those stem cells that come from your own tissues, it may be, may be promising for growing the new meniscus. So we, theoretically we're there, but technologically we're not yet. There are some obstacles. Sprains are the damages to the ligaments. There are, uh, yeah, probably James had something going on. So sprains, ligaments are partially torn or completely torn. So grade one, you see it's partial tear of the ligament with inflammation. Grade two, more profound ligament. Grade three, like all ligaments in the joint are torn. Same reason um, for the poor ligament repair. They have not a lot of vascular. They, they have no vascularization essentially. Okay, they receive nutrients from the synovial fluid. Okay, so that lack of poor vascularization leads to very slow repair. If there is a tear, what are the options? Treatment options. Sew ends together. In case of complete tear, it's really hard because ligaments are not very thick and sewable material. Can be done though. Another option is the graft. In this case, lack of vascularization is actually beneficial because if there are no blood vessels, no immune cells are reaching the ligament, which means no rejection. Very frequently, torn ligaments can be replaced by, say, bovine ligaments or porcine ligaments, ligaments from cows and, and pigs, okay? Um, I personally had a, a ligament injury, left, um, left wrist, and the guy who was evaluating me, orthopedic surgeon, he said, yeah, I can repair that. Um, I asked him, What's, what, what does it entail, and he told me, Arthroscopic surgery, I'm going to get in, I'm going to sew it together. And my next question was, so in the long-term perspective, he said, well, six months in a cast. I told him, no, 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 it's not going to happen. I need my hands functional because I was doing mouse surgery at the time. And, of course, t another approach, if it's a partial tear, just immobilization. Go ahead. So you were doing mouse surgery? Yeah, I did, I did surgery in mice. Well, experimental surgery. I didn't try to cure them, no, don't get me wrong, no. They, they actually died after surgery. Hmm? I was just thinking, does mouse need surgery to stand? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, and, you know, six months in a cast, it's really a poor life experience. Now, dislocate, go ahead. Getting there. Okay. Right. Um, getting there. Dislocations. Bones are out of alignment, like here. Dislocations are also called laxations. Dislocation is usually associated with the sprains because if you, you know, misalign the bones, ligaments are going to get damaged. Right? So dislocation means sprain, means inflammation, means swelling, difficulty moving a joint. In kids, uh, dislocations usually uh, are 
milder, for instance, dislocation of the shoulder joint in a, ch in a child, all, often manifest child just cannot move the shoulder freely. My son had dislocation of the elbow joint. We noticed it because he couldn't touch his shoulders like this. That's where his hands stopped. And it was fixed in like five seconds by popping it in, not by me. Okay? So um, the treatment, put it back in place, reduce the movement, let it heal. For practically any joint injury, if it is not associated with a complete tear of the meniscus or a ligament, if it's just a sprain, reduction, reduction of movement, reduction of weight-bearing function will treat it. Does that make sense? It's just a sprain. Hmm? You said if it's just a sprain. If it's not a complete tear. Complete tear may require surgery to repair because if they are separated like this, they're not going to properly grow back together. You were asking about inflammation of tendons and bursae. Yes, they can get inflamed. Bursa, if it inflames, called bursitis. Um, people who, when they work, you know, people who stand on their knees when they work, like electricians, plumbers, okay, they often wear, and always actually wear, the protective knee pads. When you stand on your knees long enough, constant pressure on the infrapatellar fat pad will cause inflammation of that fat pad. It will go away if you stop putting pressure on it, but it takes time. Another condition associated with the joint is tendonitis. That's the tennis elbow or golf golfer elbow. What do you have? Huh? Okay. Yeah, so um, that's tendonitis. Okay. Um, because of the constant pulling effort by the muscle, tendon that attaches the muscle, in this case, you know, uh, extensors, extensor carpi radialis uh, to the humerus. This tendon uh, becomes experiences those micro tears. Micro tears lead to inflammation, since the mechanical this force is not resolved. Does that make sense? It is not resolved. Um, inflammation becomes chronic. There is no effective treatment for tendonitis. Mild cases can be treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. More severe cases, injections of steroids into the joint, which are temporary and largely not effective. Uh, from my personal conversation with orthopedic surgeon, he said that they treat tennis elbow with actually a surgery. So they remove inflamed layers of the tendon. I don't know how it affects the stability of the joint or strength of the muscle. Arthritis. Generally, it's, arthritis is the word for inflammatory disease that may lead to the degeneration of the tissues, disease that affects joints. Arthritis refers specifically to joints most widely spread crippling disease in the states. In all arthritis cases, joints are stiff, painful, and swollen. You can see arthritic joints in this x-ray. Arthritis can be chronic, three types, osteo-rheumatoid and gouty arthritis, can be acute, caused by viruses or bacteria. Okay. Among chronic arthritic diseases, osteoarthritis is irreversible degenerative disease, which is common and it's the 
consequence of us living long, okay? Probably due to the effort, you know, inflammatory responses due to the wear and tear in the joints, enzymes such as metalloproteinases that are released in inflammation, they start to break down articular cartilage. Since it's a wear and tear disease, you see about half of Americans at age 85 develop osteoarthritis. It's probably normal aging. Does that make sense? Cartilage is destroyed, and think about this. If you move, if you do some activities, cartilage is destroyed, and as you become older, more cartilage is destroyed than new cartilage is deposited. Okay? So, essentially, cartilage is gone. When cartilage on the articular ends of the bones is gone, say it's a hip joint or an elbow joint, Cartilage is gone, bone ends that are exposed to each other becomes, become thicker, like a callus. They rub against each other, form callus. They remodel, essentially. They start to remodel, and that remodeling and enlargement restricts movement. Okay? Eventually, as the result of osteoarthritis, Bones can merge together. So one of the treatments, and treatment is entirely symptomatic, one of the treatments for osteoarthritis, activity, movement. Just by moving the joint, you reduce the chances that they will fuse together, those bones. Pain relievers, capsaicin creams, they don't, they don't treat, remove symptoms. Pain relievers remove symptoms. Capsaicin contains chemical capsaicin that comes from the pepper. What it does, it acts on the pain receptors, taking the pain away, just blocking the pain. Um, to your question, John. Glucosamine, chondroitin, sulfate, nutritional supplements, if you want to spend your money better, I don't know. Give it to charity. They are not effective. There's not a single clinical study with significant number of participants that would suggest that they are effective. They do not reduce the symptoms of arthritis. What about beforehand? No. no. Just nothing. Because it, beforehand, you cannot grow extra cartilage. Does that make sense? You can kind of accumulate some extra bone to prevent yourself from osteoporosis, but you cannot grow extra cartilage. So no, these treatments are not effective. Does that make sense? Seriously, just, just don't waste your money. Rheumatoid arthritis, um, autoimmune disease. It's inflammatory. We don't know. We still have no idea what causes RA. Okay, your own T cells and antibodies start to attack your own immune, your own cells in the synovial cavity. Okay, disease starts usually fairly early, 40, 50, and immune cells and antibodies, when they attack synovial membrane, they lead to the inflammation of synovial membrane. A synovial membrane inflammation called synoviitis, okay, get destroyed, leads to edema, synovial fluid and inflammatory exudate from the blood vessels accumulates in the joint, okay. Synovial membrane becomes thicker and thicker in an attempt to resolve inflammation. Think about this. That's, that's sort of a, a zero-sum game. Your immune system keep attacking synovial membrane. Immune system tries to repair it, but there is nothing to repair. There is no injury in the first place. But that constant repair effort leads to the destruction of the functional synovial membrane and replacement 
with a scar tissue forming panis. Eventually that scar tissue fuses ends of the articular articulating bones. Initially, in the beginning, by the fibrous connective tissue, this is called fibrous ankylosis, and then that fibrous connective tissue ossifies, leading to the bony ankylosis. So essentially, it completely re eliminates any movement in the joints. This disease is, again, chronic and progressive. So there is no way to stop it since we don't know what causes it. The only thing we can do is to treat it. Treatments for rheumatoid arthritis include steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to reduce inflammation. So pretty much it hits this and these stages. Does that make sense? But it's rather non-specific. Um, there are some drugs that specific anti-rheumatoid drugs. Now we have a great drug called rituximab. Rituximab is the antibody that blocks the action of pro-inflammatory molecule called tumor necrosis factor. This molecule plays a key role in the development of the arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. You block it, you very specifically reduce inflammation. It's very targeted treatment. It's expensive, but it's very targeted. Overall, we now reduce the symptoms of osteoarthritis greatly with all the drugs that we have. If ankylosis stage is reached, joint can be replaced with a prosthetic joint. This is how rheumatoid arthritis in the, in the hands is seen. You can see that bones, joints are deformed. Does that make sense? Understand the steps, the mechanism that you know, inflammation of synovial membrane and repair, and like treatment options, anti-inflammatory. Gout arthritis, um, also called gout. It's, it's a disease of elderly, mainly men, okay? Uh, uric acid is deposited in the joints, um, leads to the inflammation, usually affects toes, it's painful, um, as in any untreated type of arthritis. Constant inflammation leads to the repair like this. Repair like this leads to the joint immobilization. Okay? You can see that inflammation can be pretty severe, leading to that uh, pyogen pyogenous um, wounds, you know, the, the pus, accumulation of pus around the joints due to the inflammation. Treatment, um, anti-inflammatory drugs, drinking plenty of water to quite literally wash out uric acid with um, urine and avoidance of alcohol because alcohol consumption increases the um, levels of uric acid. Now the last type of arthritis that I wanted to mention here is the one that you can run here in this country, Lyme disease. This disease is caused by bacteria called by called Borrelia if you're curious. Burgdorferi. It's a tongue breaker. So bacteria, that's little tiny spirochete, is transmitted by ticks. Deer tick like Xodus scapularis. Um, after the infection, the person experiences initially, usually it's like mild fever, 
But then after, after a while, microorganism, if it's left untreated, can migrate to the um, joints and cause arthritic symptoms. It's not the only symptoms that it causes, but it can cause arthritis. The problem with um, this disease, Lyme disease, is that if it's not treated immediately, then treatment becomes very long and very tedious long course of antibiotics and it may not yield the complete cure. Many people who experienced Lyme disease and didn't treat it timely, they have to live with arthritic symptoms for the rest of their lives. The initial symptom after the bite, so-called erythema migrans so or bullseye rash, if you see something like that, that forms around the side of the tick bite, run to the physician. It will give antibiotics, it will take antibiotics, you will be fine. If you don't, again, treatment may take up to four months and nobody can guarantee that you will not have long-term consequences such as arthritis and maybe neurological consequences like paralysis. Yes? I do not I do not know the mechanism it's possible because allergy is often stimulated by the exposure to a certain pathogen it can happen I don't know the underlying cause um, but we can we can chat I can explain the mechanism right after we finish what I wanted to show is that we can nice nicely spared if you would look at the spread that's where the cases of the Lyme disease are, New England. Then you have Minnesota and what's that? Wisconsin, of course, who would doubt it. Um, Minnesota and Wisconsin, but Ohio is kind of, you know, in the, the good position. We don't have a lot of ticks, hence we don't have a lot of Lyme disease. Um, that's it. Go ahead with a question. So the